Today we're going back to basics. We are talking about yeast, water, and sugar. Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Beaver and today we are going back to basics. Now this is going to be a series on the channel where we are going to be looking at each individual part of the home distillation process. We'll talk a little bit about equipment as well as ingredients and processes as we go along. Each video will be a theory video followed up by a practical video. Now first up in the back to basic series as always we need to start at the beginning and that's fermentation now this video will be broken up into three sections section number one will be equipment so we're going to be discussing the bare essentials that you're going to need to start your first fermentation to move into distillation secondly we'll talk about ingredients so the three main ingredients and then the third part of this video will be looking at some additional add-ons that will make your process a lot easier and ensure that you have a successful fermentation. So let's kick off with the equipment. First up on the equipment list is something to ferment in. Now this is a 50 liter fermenter. Once again, if you want one of these fermenters, I'll put a link down below. But this is a 50 liter ferment. So it has a capacity if we fill it up all the way to be at 50 liters. Now the reason why we got this fermenter for the channel is because we increased our still size from 35 liters up to 50 liters and doing 20 liter batches um, just didn't work out so lucky anymore. So we now upscaled to this 50 liter fermenter. Couple of things on fermenters. Number one, ensure that you get a fermenter that has a nice big hole at the top. Reason why I say you need a nice big hole at the top so it makes it easy to get your ingredients into the fermenter as well as to clean out your fermenter. Now this is not like the beer brewers that have to sanitize the living hell out of everything. If you're one of those guys, great. I also still sanitize just to keep any additional buggies away. But I just make sure I can get my hand into the fermenter so I can clean off any of the debris or whatever. The next thing up is a way to close your fermenter. Now you can do an open ferment, you can just put a mesh bag over the top or whatever you want, but I prefer to keep my fermenters, sorry, my fermenters closed. Now the reason for that is my distill area is semi-exposed to the elements and that means bugs. Now I don't want any ants or anything or any debris dropping into my fermentation that I don't want, so I prefer to put on a lid. Now this lid does have a little hole and that brings us to the next part of the stuff that you're going to need to start your fermentation. So let's put down the fermenter and look at the next stuff. Next up when it comes to your fermenters ensure that you have some form of a spout at the bottom. The reason for this it makes it easier for you to transfer your wort in and out of your fermenter as well as to ensure that you don't have to scoop things out and you disturb the sediment once you allowed it to clear out of your fermenter. The next thing on fermenters is what material should you use for fermentation? Well that is completely up to you but I prefer to stick with one of two materials. Number one is plastic, number two is stainless steel. Yes you can use glass, carboys and that type of stuff to ferment in but I'm a very, very clumsy person, so I end up breaking glass things. I stick with plastic as well as stainless steel. Now, the reason for the plastic is it's super easy to keep clean. It is relatively inexpensive, as well as once something goes wrong with it, it gets some scarring on the inside from excessive washing or something like that. You can just buff it and get a new one. The next part is an airlock. Now this is not as essential as one should believe. This depends purely up to you. Like I said, you can do an open fermentation. The commercial distillers do it. They have no hassles, but me here, yeah, I prefer to put an airlock on my fermenter. The reason for that is I can keep any nasty buggies or anything from getting into my fermentation. So I control the whole process. 
if I had an area that is completely isolated from anything that can interfere with my fermentation, yes, I'll probably leave the airlock off. It's not as necessary, but I prefer to use it. They're relatively inexpensive. It allows CO2 ex to escape, CO2 to escape, but it doesn't allow anything else to get into the fermentation. And it's also handy to see when and if your fermentation kicks off, as well as when your fermentation has ended. Now this brings us to our next piece of equipment and this is probably something I never thought I would be using as much as I do but once I got it I couldn't stop using it. When I started distilling there was no need for any of this equipment and all the other stuff meaning hydrometers and alcometers we went by feel and touch but since I got my hydrometer it has been an absolute pleasure using it and my fermentations have become a lot better. Now what is a hydrometer? Now a hydrometer is just basically a density meter. Yes, I keep mine in some no rinse sanitizer. This just ensures that it's ready to use whenever I want to dump it into my fermenter to check my gravity. Now what is gravity? Well, gravity is the amount of sugar that is dissolved in your fermentation. Yes, the gravity can differ depending on the other things that you mix into your fermentation. It doesn't purely just read sugar, but for all intensive purposes and the purposes of home distilling, this measures the amount of sugar that is dissolved in your wash. And that is then expressed in potential alcohol by volume. If you want to know more about alcometers and hydrometers and that type of stuff, I'll link videos up here as well as down in the description box that goes into more detail on how to read an alcometer and how to use an alcometer. But all you need to know, it is an essential piece of kit to ensure that you know when your fermentation has finished because this will tell you when all the sugar has been converted into alcohol. Once again, I'll put links up here and down there if you want to learn more about the alcometers as well as a video that I did, which I'll link down below on how to make your own hydrometer to test the sugar content within your fermentation. So if you don't want to spend the big bucks and you just want to get into the hobby, and test the amount of sugars there's a link down below where you can make yourself a nice little nifty hydrometer the next piece of kit that i think is crucial or not crucial but very important to start off the home distilling hobby is a thermometer now the thermometer that i have here is just a normal float thermometer this is just a basic one that you can dump into your uh, fermentation or your mixing when you are going about and you want to test the temperature you just dump this in there we'll read the temperature and you can adjust your temperatures accordingly now why do you want to adjust temperatures well we'll talk about that when we get to the next part and that's how to use your ingredients so yeah another piece of kit they're relatively inexpensive you can use the digital types if you want but this is relatively easy i just float it inside of my fermenter when i start doing my calculations or start bringing the temperature down to pitch my yeast and i know exactly what temperature i am at also works great when you're mashing in and all that just to test the temperature of your wort or wash now those are my very essential things that you need to start with your first fermentation now there are other extras that we'll talk about at the end of the video that will just make it a lot easier but we'll discuss that once we're at the end let's move on to the next part and this now is the ingredients now for you to do a fermentation you just need three ingredients contrary to popular belief and all the guys out there three ingredients is all you need to do a fermentation you need water you need sugar and you need yeast Yes, there's a whole lot of other things that go along with that. But if you mix those three basic things together, and this is the video that we will be doing a straightforward sugar wash with no nutrients, nothing. We're just going to dump sugar into a fermenter, invert the sugars, and then we're going to ferment and then distill it. Now let's move on to the next segment of the video, the ingredients. Now, contrary to popular belief, you only need three ingredients to actually do a fermentation. I'm not saying you're going to be making whiskey out of this, but to do your very first fermentation, and this is what I would suggest, start with a basic sugar wash. Now, we're going to be doing a sugar wash on the channel that we're not going to be adding any of the used nutrients or anything like that. If you don't know what that is, we'll talk about it at the end of the video. But 
we will be just be doing a straightforward sugar wash, not a TPW or a TFP, just a straightforward sugar wash. Now, if you want to see the video where we actually do the practical one, the sugar wash, please hit that subscribe button down below and give the video a like. So I know the back to basic series is something that you guys want some more of. Now let's start with the first ingredient on the list and that is H2O or water. Now, the water, I haven't done so much research on water or experiments on the water side of distillation, but the home brewers, the beer guys, as well as the whiskey guys swear by water chemistry. Now, what I mean about water chemistry is changing the actual chemical composition of the water, adding brewing salts to the water to change the profile and flavor of the product that you're going to get out at the end. Now we will be doing some more experiments on the channel in the future where we're going to start playing around with water chemistry. If you have any experience in that and you actually use it during your distillation process to improve a whiskey or a brandy or even a sugar wash, please put it down in the comment section down below. I'm pretty sure a lot of guys will find it pretty interesting if um, there is any difference between using brewing salts in your fermentation and then distillation than just using straight water. Now a couple of tips on water or the things that I look out for when I start my fermentation. Number one, I need to know where my water comes from. I am happy to use water that comes from my well or from my municipality as long as I can drink it without any hesitation or having to filter it beforehand, I'll use it in my fermentation. If it has any form of a smell on the water, meaning it has a sulfur or a rotten egg smell coming off or a very heavy chlorine smell, I would suggest you don't use that because if you can smell it coming off of water, you'll more than likely be able to get those smells to transfer over in your distillation process. I suggest if you smell the water and it smells good, then you can use it. If you're willing to drink it, then you can use it. Last point on water, check your water's pH. Now you only need to do this once or twice if you know where your water comes from to ensure that you don't have anything that will spike out of control. But in general, when you take well water or you take municipal water, it should be around a 7 pH or pH neutral. Next up on the ingredients, sugar. Now sugar is probably one of the most misunderstood things when it comes to your very first fermentation because there is a lot of myths and rumors surrounding sugar and how you should use sugar. Now we're not going to go into depth on the different kinds of sugar as well as how to use the different kinds of sugar. All we need to know about sugar is there is two distinct different types or for me at least there's two categories. Number one is easily accessible sugars. Now these are sugars that are readily accessible. All you need to do is either mash up some fruit and dump some water in there and you have sugar available to you or you just take sugar like I have in front of me here. This is pure cane sugar. Dump it into a ferment to ensure it dissolves and then you have sugar available for fermentation. The other type of sugar is the one that's a little bit harder to get. Or not actually get, but get at. Now this is the sugar that you're going to have to work for. Now this is malted barley that I have here for another video coming up. Now this year has sugar in it, but that sugar is in the form of starch. So what we need to do is we need to follow a very specific process to unlock the starches within the grains and then convert that into sugars. Now, if you want to know more about the whole process of how to convert starch into sugar, I'll put a video up here where I do a couple of all grain recipes. I will also link a couple of videos down below to other guys that have, that, that have explained the whole process of how to mash in and convert starch into sugar. Now cycling back to the sugar, a couple of rules that I follow and once again I'll put a link up here to a video that I did with five quick tips on how to improve your sugar washes as well as fruit washes. But with sugar, I never go more than 250 grams per liter of wash. Now this is total sugar that includes the amount that I get from the fruit. We'll go do a video on how to calculate the recipe once we get into this whole back to basics and once we get past the fermentation but we'll do a video on the recipes for now all you need to know is that I limit myself 
to 250 grams of sugar per liter of wash. The reason why I stick to 250 grams per liter of wash is that gives me around about 10% ABV and that's more than enough for me to chuck into my still and have a proper distillation as well as keep it inside of the margins that my yeast is able to consume so I don't stress my yeast out and I get really off flavors. There are a couple of things that you can do with sugar to improve it in the distillation process or in the fermentation process. One of them is to invert your sugars. I'll put links to videos down below and up here again once again to where Jesse as well as Bearded did proper explanations on what inverting sugar means and how it affects the end distillate. If you guys want to check that out, all you need to know is that yes, there are a couple of things that you can do to sugar to make it to ferment easier. Now next up on the list is yeast. Now I did a video on going in depth into the different types of yeasts uh, or the yeast strains out there. I'll put a link up here as well as a link down below. I think I might have run out of links so just check the description box down below if it's not up here. Yes, yeast has a massive impact on your end product. The yeast will bring flavors to the foreground or work off of sugars and flavors that will end up in your distillation a lot more than anything else that you can add into your fermenter. So yes, your yeast choice is very important, but not to confuse the subject, if you wanna get into the hobby of distillation, do not feel ashamed to start off with standard baker's yeast. Believe me, we have all done it. But if I can make a suggestion on yeast, I'll start off with a product called Sweet Daddy Yeast. Now this is a distiller's active dry yeast. This is designed to work at a large temperature range as well as consume a lot of sugar with very little nutrients. So it's designed to work in relatively harsh conditions, if you wanna call it that. Now I'll put a link down below if you wanna get your hands on some distiller's active dry yeast. That is my suggestion for a yeast choice. But if you, don't have a lot of options when it comes to yeast, get a packet of brewer's yeast or baker's yeast from your local supermarket and start off your process with that. Those yeast or the saccharomyces that I have in those yeast packets, they have a big temperature range as well as some tolerance to sugar and as long as you stick to that 250 grams per liter, you'll be a-okay to use those strains of yeast. Now for the bonus round, and keep in mind that I will be discussing each of these things, including yeast and sugar and water and fermentation and everything in detail in the videos that is coming up. Now, if you guys want me to prioritize any of them, please put it down in the comment section below so I know what to prioritize in that process. Keep in mind that we're gonna be following the process as you would at home from fermentation all the way to distillation, cuts, blending, aging, all of that in basic steps going forward as well as the basic equipment that is needed. But now for the bonus round or the additional stuff that I would suggest you get when you start your distillation slash fermentation process, one of them is a graduated cylinder. Now this makes it super easy for you to test the gravity of your wort or wash so you don't have to dunk your hydrometer into a boiling vat or something or risk it cracking when it heats up too quickly if the mash is too hot or whatever you can decant into this it's a small volume and you can measure it as you can see i even break plastic but a graduated cylinder is something that's awesome to use when you are starting the hobby so pick up a nice cheap one like i say plastic ones they fall down they tend not to break unless you're me the other thing that I would suggest you get is some pH strips, or if you wanna invest, get yourself a pH meter. Now this is when you're going into more advanced recipes where you start using sugars and fruits and that type of stuff, sugars in the form of molasses and fruits in the form of lemons and oranges that will drop your pH down. Or if you're gonna be using grains that will raise your pH, you might need to get a pH strip to test your pH to see what's happening with your fermentation. 
Now we will be discussing stuck fermentations as well as stalled fermentations in future videos coming up and how to use your hydrometers if you want to stick around for that when we get to the next videos. pH strips just make it relatively easy for you to check if you have your pH in a ballpark. Look for something that goes in from the range of 4.5 and upwards. The reason for that is your yeast likes to ferment between 4 and 6. Um, anything below 4 or going even lower than 4 tends to start slowing down your yeast. Anything above 6 tends to open you up to other bacteria getting in, into your fermentation and causing infections that you don't want. Your yeast loves it between 4 and 6 and with these bad boys you can test it relatively quickly to ensure that you're within the ballpark. Next up is something to control your pH. Now this is 5.2. I find it super easy to use and I find myself every time I do a fermentation to just dump a little bit of this into the fermentation. This is used by home brewers to keep your pH stable. It's called a buffer solution so it doesn't raise your pH or lower your pH. It keeps it at 5.2 and it prevents it from drifting away from there from going up or down and it keeps your yeast nice and happy. This is a little extra bonus thing that I love to keep around. And last but not least, nutrients. Now, I did say in the, in the beginning of the video that yes, you only need water, sugar, and yeast to do your fermentation, but nutrients make a hell of a difference. If you think of it like in the form of a motor vehicle, a car with a diesel or petrol engine, you can have as much fuel in the car as you want, but if you don't have oil and water within your engine to keep it running smoothly and keep it nice and cool, your car will fail on you. Now the yeast is exactly the same. Think of the sugar as the fuel for the yeast. It's gonna consume the sugars, but it needs that extra nutrients to keep them multiplying and keep them doing their jobs. So you'll see maybe you have your fermentation kicking off and then slowing down. Once again, discuss that in future videos. But that is where your nutrients come in. So grab yourself some diamonium phosphate. It's a white powder that's used in your fermentation. It is safe to consume, so it is perfectly fine to use within your fermentation. You can also get your super nutrients as well as uh, Fermate O and all that other type of nutrients. Just get yourself a nutrient that you have readily available so you can use it. Yes, you can use a whole bunch of other stuff. We'll discuss it in future videos. Now, if you stuck around this far, thank you very much for watching and have a lucky day.